Amen. Well, hey, as we get started today in this message, I want to start with a story. And it goes like this. One time there was a man who worked in a factory. And as this man was leaving work one day, he's pushing a wheelbarrow right down the hallway. And inside of the wheelbarrow is this little tiny box, just a little bit bigger than a shoe box. And inside of this box is filled with sawdust. I know it sounds weird, but he's pushing this wheelbarrow and he gets to the guard shack and security guard says, excuse me, sir, what you got going on there? And he goes, oh, it's just a little, it's just a little box. And the guard goes, well, yeah, no, I see that. I get that. But you got to, what's, what's in the box? And he goes, you know how at the end of every shift, there's always sawdust that's on the floor? Well, you know, we usually just sweep that up and throw it away. But today I was sweeping it up and I realized I actually need some sawdust. So I put some in this box and I didn't think it was going to be a big deal. I'm just taking it home. And I didn't think, you know, it'd be that big deal. And the security guard is confused. And he says, well, you got to open the box. So he opens the box and sure enough, filled to the brim in this little tiny box is sawdust. So the guard is a, a little bit confused, but he says, you know, on your way. So the next day, this exact same thing happens. He's pushing his wheelbarrow. Sure enough, what's in the box? It's sawdust. Really? Okay, go on your way. Wednesday, same thing. Thursday, same thing. Now, by this point, the security guard is getting frustrated. He knows something's going on. He just can't put his finger on it. Friday, here comes the man. He's pushing his wheelbarrow right inside is this little box. And the guy goes, if you tell me that there's sawdust in that box, I'm going to lose it on you. And he goes, well, open the box. And sure enough, inside of the box, sawdust. And the guy is livid. He's like, look, man, I can't sleep. I can't eat. I think my wife's about to leave me because I won't stop talking about this. Like, What's the deal? I know you're up to something. I just can't put my finger on it. He goes, look, man, it's just, it's just sawdust. And the guy goes, look, man, I know you're stealing something. I can't figure it out. But if you tell me what it is you're stealing, he says, I won't even turn you in. He goes, for real? I've been stealing wheelbarrows. <laughs> now, silly story, but here's the point. The point is, it's just like that in our lives that we can often focus on the wrong thing. We can get so caught up in this little distraction that we miss the big picture. And today there's going to be several opportunities for you to get distracted. Several opportunities for you to focus on the sawdust and miss the wheelbarrow. So I'm just setting you up now. Now today we are in part number five of the series that we're calling On Mission. <clears throat> This is a series that we have been in looking at the Great Commission. What is the Great Commission? Well, the Great Commission is Jesus' last words that he spoke on this earth to his disciples before he left to go to heaven. Now, how many of you know that last words are a big deal? I think many of us may have memories of a loved one or someone special, and we can go right back to that moment where we heard their last words. And we can be right back in that room or in that hospital or in that, whatever it is, we're right back in that moment where we remember their last words and they'll stick with us forever. Matter of fact, there are books and there are, there are YouTube videos and websites completely dedicated to the last words of famous people because last words are significant. But they're even more significant when the person who is speaking those words understands and recognizes that those are their last words. They're spoken with a sobriety. They're spoken with this intentionality and it causes the listener to lean in. And these are Jesus's last words. And we're actually gonna look at those. We've read the scripture several times throughout this series, but we're gonna look at it again. We're in Mark chapter 16 and we're gonna be in verses 15 and 16. Now I'm gonna be reading from the New Living Translation today. Whatever translation you have is a-okay. Somebody said, what's the best translation to read? The one that you'll actually pick up and read. That's the one for you. But I'm in the New Living Translation today. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. This is Jesus talking. And he says, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. And anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But anyone who refuses will be condemned. So what does Jesus tell them to do? He says, number one, he says to go. Where does he say to go? He says to go into all the world. And what does he tell them to do? He says to go into all the world <clears throat> and preach. Now, I know some of you just said, I'm so glad he's not talking to me because I just work at Bank of America. I'm not a preacher or I'm a stay at home mom. I'm not a preacher or I just whatever. 
But see, here's what this word means. This is a Greek word, keruso. Now, side note, I know you probably thought since Pastor Gil wasn't speaking today that we weren't gonna have any Greek words, but I got one for you, Pastor Gil, that one's for you. This is a Greek word, keruso, and it means to herald. It means to proclaim openly something that's happened. Now, if you've been around Christianity for any length of time, you've probably heard this quote. Maybe you've seen it. Maybe your Aunt Margaret posted it on her Facebook or whatever. And the quote is, preach the gospel at all times. And if necessary, come on, if you know it, say it. use words. And, 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 and while I understand the, what the author of that quote was trying to say, man, we need to live a life that's not hypocritical. We need to live a life that points people to Jesus. We need to live a life that represents the goodness of God to a world that needs it. The fact is, if I'm reading my Bible, we are called to preach, to openly proclaim something that's happened. In the book of Romans chapter 10, verse 14, it says it like this. It says, how then can someone call upon someone that they haven't believed in? And how can they believe in someone if they've never heard about them? And how can they hear of someone unless someone preaches to them? Just a few verses later in Romans 10, 17, it says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we're called to what? Go into all the world and to preach. What are we called to preach? Oh, we're called to preach the good news. And you say, what is the good news? And what if I told you this morning that it's not just good news, it's great news. It's that God created a perfect world and he put man and woman right in the middle of this perfect world and gave them a choice. And they chose to disobey. And because of their choice, sin entered the world. And because sin entered the world, death entered the world, not just physical death, but spiritual death, eternal separation from God. And you say, wow, that's super encouraging, pastor. Come on, it gets better. Romans 3.23 reminds us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says that there's a price for our sin. It says that the wages of sin is death. And you're like, I'm feeling really encouraged now, pastor. But but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrated his love towards us and that while we were still sinners and far from him, he sent Jesus to come and die for us. Romans 10, 9 says that if we would believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that we would be saved, eternally saved, headed towards heaven. Romans 10, 13 says that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And you say, man, that's some good news. Come on, it gets even better. Romans 5 1 says that we are now justified by our faith and we have peace with God. What does it mean to be justified? It means that God took all of our sin and made a divine exchange. And he doesn't look at us according to our sin anymore because he placed the righteousness of Christ Jesus upon us. And now Romans 8 1 says that now there's no condemnation, there's no guilt or shame to anyone who is in Christ Jesus. As we walk upon this earth, we're not just saved to go to heaven, but we walk in the peace of God on this earth. And you say it can't possibly get any better than that. It absolutely does. Luke 4 18. Jesus talking. He says, the spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel. I have come that captives would be released, that blind eyes would see, and that those who are oppressed would be set free. That means absolutely we are saved from our sins, headed to a place called heaven, escaping the reality of a place called hell. But while we walk on this earth, we get to walk in his freedom, in his healing, in his peace, and we're called to carry that to a lost and to a dying world. And I'm telling you, I am preaching better right now than you are responding. Somebody say amen this morning. <laughs> I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> no, listen, Jesus said to go and to preach the good news. In Matthew chapter 28, we find this same exact story of the Great Commission, but I love how in the Gospels, each author kind of has their own little flavor. They each have their own little flavor. And in this one, Matthew, in chapter 28, in verse 18 through 20, he says, all authority has been given to me, now go. Parents, if you have kids, you've probably used this one before. Oftentimes, my daughter, Aubrey, will come downstairs and she'll, she has, she'll say, Dad, Carter is messing with me. And I'll say, Aubrey, I want you to go upstairs and I want you to tell Carter. Say, Carter, Dad said, knock it off. 
And every time I do that, I watch her little personality just go. She gets this little pep in her step because she's been given a task to carry a message and she's not responsible for the outcome. She's only responsible to deliver the message. And she knows that if Carter has a problem with that message, it's not between her and Carter, it's between me and Carter. I say, Aubrey, dad said, and she pops up the steps, Carter, dad said, knock it off. And she speaks with this confidence. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. Now go, now go preach the gospel, go make disciples, go teach them all that I've commanded them to do. And I love this, he throws it in and he goes, oh, and by the way, I'm with you every step of the way. I'm with you every single step of the way. Listen, God has called us to this big mission, go into all the world, what? But I'm with you every step of the way. Now, up to this point in this series, we've looked at a couple of different things. We've looked at this authority that calls us to go. We've looked at the fact that we have to be mission-minded and that we have to have this heart of compassion. We looked at the message that we are to carry. Today, it gets real fun because this is application day. This is activation day. Today, we're looking at what is my mission. Today is my mission, taking personal ownership, personal accountability for the Great Commission. And I don't know if there's a better example in all of the Bible than the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul was the man. Like, Paul preached the gospel. He went on missionary trips. Paul was shipwrecked. They tried to kill him. They put him in prison, and he sang until the, the prison doors opened. Like, he's, he's responsible directly or indirectly for nearly half of the New Testament. But see, Paul was not a likely candidate to be the one to be as influential as he was. I mean, literally besides Jesus, Paul might be the next most influential person in the New Testament. You see, Paul was born as this man named Saul. He grew up as a good Jewish boy. He learned a craft, he was a tent maker. So he wasn't born into nobility and riches. He was a man of the people. He wasn't necessarily poor, but he was common. He was a man of the people. We can see from his writings, even the language that he used, he was a man of the people, not of nobility. But as he grew, he became one of the Pharisees. Now you may have heard who the Pharisees are, but the Pharisees were the religious leaders for the Jewish people. But maybe more accurately than just religious leaders is they were scholars of the Torah, of the Hebrew Bible. And maybe the de facto enforcers of the law. The Pharisees were notorious for adding their own traditions to the law and holding people to this law that was already unable to be lived up to. Now there's even more things on top of it. And the Pharisees, maybe most importantly, did not accept Jesus Christ as the Messiah. So here comes Jesus onto the scene doing miracles, saying, I am the Messiah, the promised one. And he's drawing a crowd and people are beginning to follow him. And if you were Jewish in that time, if you were a Pharisee, you would probably go, we gotta stop this. We can't let this happen. And that's exactly what they did. The Pharisees were the ones leading the charge and persecuting the early church. And Saul was right there with them. And one day, Saul is on this trip to a place called Damascus and God radically encounters him. God speaks new life into him. He changes his name to Paul. He changes his life. He gives him a new mission. And the rest of his life, he dedicated to preaching the gospel. So there's really no better example to follow than that of Paul. Now, we're gonna look at this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter nine. And this is our first wheelbarrow and, and uh, sawdust moment. Because Paul's talking about a lot of different things. He's stating his case for for, for why he has the authority he has. And he's talking about, oh, when I'm with this person, I do this. And when I'm over here, I do this. And, 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 and I'm free from this. And I'm not under this law and all of that. And we can talk about that and our Christian liberties and freedom in Christ on a different day. But what I want you to focus on today is the way that Paul talks about taking personal ownership of the gospel. First Corinthians chapter nine, we're in verse 19. And Paul says, even though I'm a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, he's talking about when he was ministering to the Jews and he would share the gospel with the Jews. He said, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. He's saying, I put myself under their law and became like them. 
so that my life wouldn't be a hindrance or a distraction. He says, even though I'm not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who were under the law. When I'm with the Gentiles who don't follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. He's saying right here that, that, that I don't have to live according to those Jewish laws and traditions, but I live in a way that is appealing to the Gentiles. This right here, he says, I don't ignore the law of God. He's saying, I'm not out here, I'm not lawless. I'm not killing people, I'm not stealing, I'm not ignoring God's laws. He says, I obey the law of Christ, that inward law that's on our heart, living from our convictions. He says, when I'm with those who are weak, I share in their weakness. Many people back then, they had these restrictions, oh, you gotta eat this or you can't eat this, you can't do this. And Paul's like, I know that the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or what we drink, but if I'm with someone and they say that we can't eat this, even though I know that it's unclean, it doesn't bother me to eat it, I I push that preference to the side so that I'm not a distraction. I wanna bring the weak to Christ. I try and find common ground with everyone doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and to share in the gospel. Now, here's what I want you to focus on right here. In these five verses, Paul uses the personal pronoun I 14 times. This isn't a study in numerology. There's no significance to the number 14 here. Here's what you need to know. Paul understood that he had a personal responsibility to share the gospel. Paul understood that he had a world to impact And he was moved with compassion and said, I will do everything I can short of breaking God's law to reach the world around me. And why did he do that? First Thessalonians chapter two, verse 19 and 20, Paul says, after all, what gives us hope and joy and what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord when he returns? It is you. Yes, you are our pride and joy. He's talking to the church at this place called Thessalonica. And he says, one day when I stand before the Lord, it's not my accomplishments. It's not my accolades. It's not the, 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 the number of people I was able to stand in front of. It's not the, the, the places I had access to. It's not the rewards that I earned, but it's you. When I stand before Jesus Christ and say, look, God, I did the best I could. That is, You, you are my reward. See, Paul understood that the only thing that we can take with us when we leave this earth is people. The only thing we can take with us when we leave this earth is people. And Paul understood that. And so today, as we take this whole series and we begin to bring it to conclusion here, we're gonna try and get super practical today, okay? It might even get a little uncomfortable, but we wanna get super practical today because it's not enough to just know the Great Commission, we have to activate the Great Commission in our life. And here's the first thing that I wanna leave you with. We have to identify our world and see them like Jesus does. We have to identify our world and see them like Jesus does. What does that mean? We have to recognize, number one, that we've been put on this earth, we've been given a sphere of influence. There are people that we come in contact with on the regular. It could be in our family. It could be, uh, it could be our, our, our neighbors, our neighborhood. It could be at the PTA. It could be the guy at Starbucks who always makes your drink. It could be the guy at the gas station who always asks how the family is. Like we have a circle of influence and we have to, number one, identify our world. We have to say, God, you've given me an influence. We're called go into all the world, but you can't go into all the world, but we can. We can, if you reach some and you reach some and you reach some and you reach some, we can go into all the world. We're not on mission alone, but we're on mission together. So we have to identify our world, but then we have to see our world like Jesus sees the world. That may mean you have to slow down a little bit. That may mean you have to fight against this productivity culture that says we can't slow down, we can't give up that promotion, we can't do, we have to keep moving, we have to keep progressing because if we're not going forward, we're going backwards. If we don't, if we don't, and I'm telling you, you'll miss your assignment. You'll miss the assignment that's right in front of you because you'll go, hey man, how's it going? Good, all right, cool. I have a friend and when he asks me, how's it going? This is how the conversation goes. He goes, hey man, how's it going? And I go, it's great, man. And he goes, 
And I'm getting, I'm like, well, I mean, I mean, it's okay. Like, I mean, it's not like, it's not great. Like, I mean, I'm a little busy, you know, work's going, you know, work's, work's kind of busy right now. And he's just, I mean, it's not that bad, right? Like, if it's, and he's leaving space. He's leaving room because people love to talk about themselves. Whether they admit it or not, people love to talk about themselves. He's chosen to intentionally live in such a way that he can see people as Jesus does. Now, I know you've been looking at this chair now for the last 20 minutes and wondering what in the world does this chair have to do with the gospel? And I hope you're not disappointed by this illustration, but this chair simply represents one person in your world. Maybe this chair is your mom. Maybe it's your stepdad. Maybe it's your brother-in-law who was hurt by the church. And every time church and Jesus comes up at Thanksgiving, he just kinda, kinda smiles. Maybe this is your sister that you talk to every single day. You laugh together, you cry together, but you know she's going through it. You know she needs the Lord. Maybe this is that quirky, funny, non-judgmental person who cuts your hair. Maybe that's Pete at the gas station who always asks how the family is. But this chair is one person in your world. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna get super practical today. We're gonna make a list. You say, what? I want you to take out your phone and your notes app. Maybe write this in your journal or the back of your Bible. Maybe grab one of those connect cards and scribble it down. But here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take 60 seconds right here in this service. And you say, that sounds really awkward. Yeah, it might be. But you know what? This is for real. This is eternity. This chair is a soul who needs Jesus. And without Jesus, they're headed to a real place called hell where they will be forever separated from Jesus. So you say, that's awkward to take 60 seconds and make a list. Come on, push through it. Here's what we're doing. We're taking 60 seconds. I want you to start right now. Make a list. And I want you to identify three to five people in your world who you know need Jesus. Three to five people in your world who you know need Jesus. And as you begin to finish that list, I want you to look at this chair and I want you to say, God, give me your eyes to see them the way that you see them. Help me to see them the way that you see them. Come on, take about 30 more seconds. Jesus, give us your eyes to see. Open our eyes to see the world around us like you see. Give us a heart of compassion. In the 1800s, there was an evangelist named D.L. Moody. You've probably heard of him before if you've been around Christianity for any length of time. D.L. Moody did what we're doing right now. He was moved with compassion to identify 100 people in his world that needed Jesus, that needed the good news of the gospel. And over the rest of his life, he kept that list. He prayed over that list. He looked for opportunities to share the gospel. And for the rest of his life, his records indicated that because of direct conversation or because of his evangelistic ministry, 96 of the 100 people came to know the Lord. And at his funeral, when they presented the gospel, the remaining four people gave their lives to the Lord. Listen, we gotta identify our world. We gotta see them like Jesus does. But point number two is this, we've gotta pray big, bold prayers for our world. And we've gotta get filled up. What do you mean pray big, bold prayers? Listen, 1 John 5, 14 says this, it says, now this, is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, that he hears us. What's his will? Second Peter 3, 9 says that he doesn't want anyone to perish, 
but that all would come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He says, and we know that if he hears us, that whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've asked. Basically, we know that if we pray according to his will, he listens, and if he listens, he will respond to those prayers. I don't know where to start. Come on, we use God's word. I put just a couple up here on the screen. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse six. We can pray that light would shine in the darkness of their heart, illuminating those areas and giving them revelation of the gospel. John 6, 44, we can pray that they would be drawn by the Holy Spirit to the Father. Acts chapter 11, verse 18, we can pray that God would grant them the privilege of repentance, that they might be saved. Matthew chapter nine, verse 37 and 38, it says that the harvest is ready, it's ripe, and the harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers into the field. Come on, we're not on mission by ourselves. We can pray that God would send people before us, send people behind us. Some would plant seeds, some would water that seed. We may not see the harvest, but we're not responsible for the results. We're responsible to go and to preach the gospel. So we pray big, bold prayers for our world, and then we gotta get filled up. Now, this little illustration here, this is almost so silly that I thought about not doing it, but I figured I'd go ahead and do it. This is a work glove. It's a decent glove, I mean, it's Home Depot special, but it's got a, a leather palm, it's got Velcro strap, it's got good stitching. This glove was made to do work and it has the capacity to do work. It was designed and engineered to do work. So if I say, glove, pick up this pin, nothing happens. And you say, oh, I know, that glove just needs to be encouraged. Come on, glove. You can do it, man. You were made for this. You were called to do this. You can do this. Nothing. Oh, maybe this glove just needs some more instruction. Maybe it needs a little bit of one-on-one, -on -one, some discipleship. So, oh, look, so look, you're gonna take your thumb and your fingers and you're gonna put them together just like, nothing. Oh, I know, maybe this glove just needs to get around other like-minded gloves and it'll rub off on them. So we're gonna make a little fellowship here. We're gonna bring some other gloves, bring some gloves in here. These gloves love Jesus. We're gonna make it a multicultural fellowship here. We're gonna keep, we're gonna keep going. We're gonna surround him with other gloves who love to do work and nothing. Oh, I know, this glove just needs to make a fresh commitment to being a glove. It needs to walk an aisle, it needs to say a prayer, it needs to raise its hand. It's pretty painfully obvious, I'm gonna stop. This glove was designed to do work. But until a living hand fills every single part of this glove, this glove cannot accomplish what it was made to do. This glove can do nothing apart from the filling of a living hand. And in the same way, we are called to fulfill the Great Commission. We, are, we, are, we have the capacity for it. We've been designed to do it. But apart from the filling of the Holy Spirit, it's not about wanting it more, it's not about making a commitment, but apart from the filling of the Holy Spirit, we can do absolutely nothing. Listen, in the book of Acts, we read this story and it says that, that the disciples were all in one room and they were, they were told to wait for the promise. They were told to wait for the promise. They were told that when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, that they would receive power to go and preach the gospel. And it says that they were in one room and they were all praying when suddenly, suddenly a sound like a mighty rushing wind filled the room and what looked like lanterns of fire rested upon their heads and they all began to speak in tongues and it says this, it says that the sound drew people to the place where they were. The sound drew people in. And Peter, being filled with the Holy Spirit, was moved to preach to the people, to preach Jesus crucified and risen again. And it says that the words he spoke pierced their hearts to the point where they said, just tell us what we have to do. 
And it says that that day, 3,000 people came to know Jesus Christ. Why? Because Peter preached such a good message, because Peter had all the answers, because Peter knew exactly what to do. No, Peter was filled, filled with the Holy Spirit. God has called us to go into this world, to spread the gospel, to make disciples, but apart from the moving and the filling and the stirring of his Holy Spirit, we can do nothing. So we pray bold prayers for our world and we get filled up. And this one might be the simplest, but it's by no means the easiest. We gotta go for it. Like Michael Scott said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Wayne Gretzky, Michael Scott. If you get that reference, you're my people. If you don't, just ignore it. So listen, you gotta go for it and you say, but I'm not ready. Go anyway. But I'm scared. Do it scared. You say, you say, I don't have all the answers. Nobody said you had to. Look, come on. We wanna grow as a Christian. We wanna, we wanna learn some of these answers about these hard questions. It's not an excuse to just not grow. But if you're put on a witness stand, you're asked to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Did you see what happened? No, I did not see what happened. Next question. Did you see what happened? Yes, I saw what happened. What happened? Well, this happened. That's all you're responsible for. You're responsible to go. The woman at the well had an encounter with Jesus. It was revealed to her that he was the Messiah. And it says that she ran back to her village. And what did she say? Did she say, come and see the fulfillment of many years of prophecy? Come, here's the Messiah. Come, here's, here's, this, here's this awesome guy. No, she said, come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. What a strange testimony. Come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. And the scriptures say that many in her village came to believe because of her testimony. You gotta go. I coach a little league team. And I tell my kids all the time, you gotta just swing the bat. If you don't swing the bat, you're never gonna get a hit. But if you don't swing the bat, I don't know how to coach you. I don't know how to go, oh, you're dropping your hands. Oh, you're lunging. I, if you don't swing the bat, I can't help you. We gotta go for it. And you say, I don't even know what to say. What, what do I even say? If the situation was turned around, what would you want someone to say to you? I imagine it may go something like this. Hey man, I'm, thanks for meeting me today. I appreciate it. Hey, I just want you to know, I've been thinking about you, I've been praying for you. I know the last year has been really hard. I can't imagine how hard it was to lose your mom. And I've just been praying that God would remind you that he loves you and that he would send people into your life to remind you that he loves you. Hey, listen, I know this might be, this might be awkward, but could I share something with you? And if they say yes, go, hey, listen, man, you know I'm a Christian. You know that I believe God's word. I believe that the Bible is God's word and it's my true north. It's my direction in life. And the Bible teaches me that God created this perfect world, but sin entered the picture. And that sin separated us from a holy and a perfect God. But John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish, but they would have everlasting life. And, and I gotta ask you, has there ever been a moment where you recognized that you were a sinner, that your sin separates you from God, and that the only way back to heaven and back to God and back to peace and back to joy is through a relationship with Jesus Christ? No, I've never, never even heard that. Would you like to? And you lead them as best as you can right to the heart of Jesus. How? 
I'll keep it simple. A, B, C's. A, God, I admit that I'm a sinner. And I admit that my sin separates me from you. That without you, I am headed for a real place called hell. But I believe that you sent Jesus to die in my place, to be my substitution, to pay the debt that my sin created so that I could live with you forever. And now I see, confess to the best of my ability that Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. Come into my life and fill every part. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. You'd be like, that's so weird. <laughs> Baby, I don't know if it ever gets easier, but we gotta trust that the filling of the Holy Spirit will give you everything that you need to say, but you gotta go. You gotta get the bat off your shoulders and you gotta go. Now, as we bring this message to a close today, I feel like I'm speaking to a couple of different people in this room. I feel like the first group of people that I'm speaking to, you've had an encounter with the gospel and it changed your life. And you are now, to the very best of your ability, living with eyes wide open, trying to carry the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ to every part of your world. Man, keep on keeping on. Never forget that it's the power and the enabling of the Holy Spirit that helps you. I believe there's another group of people in here today. You've also had an encounter with the gospel and it changed your life. But somewhere along the way, you got hurt. Maybe the church hurts you. Maybe somebody close to you hurts you, disappointed you, let you down. Or maybe like that very first story, you took your eyes off of what was important. And you put them on things that are not important. I wanna pray for you today that you be freshly filled with the power of the Holy Spirit that he would blow across the embers of your heart and rekindle and reawaken a flame that's inside. And I believe that there's one more group of people here today and you're sitting here going, I have no idea what you're talking about. Maybe you grew up in church. Maybe you went to Sunday school. You know all of the answers. You could recite the Romans road better than I could. But there's never been a moment in your life where you said, Jesus, I need you. I can't do this on my own. And without you, I'm lost. Or maybe, again, you've never heard the gospel before and you say, that sounds incredible. How can I learn that I can have peace with God? How can I have joy in uncertain circumstances? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today is your day of salvation. So here's what I wanna do all across this room. I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're in that last group of people, you say, I know that I've never accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I've never bowed my knee to him. I'm gonna lead you in a short prayer. Now I'm gonna tell you right now, it is not the words of this prayer that saves you. The Bible says that we are saved through our faith. It's the fact that we would even speak these words and believe that this whole salvation thing is real. It's our faith that brings us into the kingdom today. But let's do this. If you know that you need to receive the Lord today, I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. I want you to repeat this. You can say it out loud. You know what, let's all do that. Let's all say it out loud today. Come on, let's fill this room with faith today. We say, dear Jesus, I thank you that you love me. And God, I know that my sin has separated me from your love. Without you, I'm headed to a place called hell. But because you loved me so much, you made a way for me. And today, I believe that Jesus is enough. 
And today, I confess that Jesus is my Lord. To the best of my ability, come into my life. Help me live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen to me, every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you said that prayer for the first time or maybe the first time in a long time, would you be bold enough to just look at me? To just look at me this morning? Yeah. Here's, here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna ask our prayer teams to, to come down to the front. If you're part of our prayer team, I want you to come be down front. Listen, if you prayed that prayer today and to the best of your abilities, you meant that, the Bible says that you are saved. We wanna put something in your hand today. We just have a little gift that we've, we've put together. If that's you, with every head bowed, every eye closed, would you just slip your hand up? If you did that, would you slip your hand up? We just wanna put something in your hand today just to help you get started on your way. Yeah, yes, I see one in the back, yeah. I see your hand, yes. Somebody's coming to you, somebody's coming to you. Yes, thank you, Lord. Anyone else, anyone else? All right, everybody look at me. The Bible tells us that all of heaven rejoices over one soul who comes to know Jesus. I'm telling you right now, heaven's throwing a party. Let's clap our hands. Let's celebrate the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Lord, we bless you and we thank you today. We bless you and we thank you today. Yes, 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 yes. Now listen, here's how I wanna end this service today. Our prayer teams are available down front. You know, if you're in that second category and you need to be filled, I'm gonna pray for you, but I want you to come down and I want you to pray with someone on our prayer team. Or maybe you just, maybe it's like, man, I don't, I don't even know what's going on. I just need a passion. I need whatever it is. I want you to come and be prayed for. Don't miss this opportunity. Today is practical application. We're here to pray with you, to help you. And Lord Jesus, we thank you right now that your Holy Spirit is moving. We thank you that right now your Holy Spirit is stirring in hearts today. God, I pray for every single person in here who has encountered you at one time in their life. But Lord, at some point the flame has grown cold. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would breathe across the embers of the hearts today that you would begin to stir and to fan into flame lord a passion for your name that right now god we don't just need more information we don't just need more encouragement we don't just need more discipleship but god we need your holy spirit so right now i'm asking that you would breathe in hearts today that you would embolden people to respond to you today. Now come on, all across this room, as we begin to lift our hands, as we begin to worship the Lord, I want us to lift our hands, and if that's you today, if you need to come and respond today, come and respond while we worship. Come on, team, come on. Come on, lift your hands in this room, lift your hands in this room, give Him praise. Give Him praise, give Him worship. Lord, we surrender to you today.